Hello everyone, today is a brand new show. Today we're going to be talking about the Starfield that is playing on Xbox Series X. And with me today is a special guest, Christian. Uh, he will be going through step by step without spoiling anything about the play gameplay of Star Starfield. Because I know a lot of people have not received the game or have not gotten the game yet to be playing it. So we will not be spoiling anything, but he's going to give you his depth in detail of what he thinks about the game. So without any further ado, let's start the show. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. Once again, I am here with Christian, who is an Xbox player and he has an Xbox Series X and owner of Starfield. Now, Christian, I may ask, the gameplay is a controversy. Most people like it, most people don't like it. What is your concept on the game? As far as, let's start with the basic story. What do you think of it? I think the story is interesting. I think the, uh, the Bethesda did a really good job at putting their own twist on a space game. And... The only thing that I'm disappointed about when it comes to the story is that if I had focused and not been moved, because almost every single time that you start one of these quests, especially with the story quest, it just kind of throws you into another side quest for whatever reason. If I had stayed on the story quest and just been focusing on it, I would have got at the most 25 hours out of it. I feel like I could probably even squeeze that down further to be honest, but like I said, I got sidetracked three or four times and one of those times was for a good hour and a half maybe two hours till i realized i was doing a side quest and that right. i didn't need to do that quest at all to continue on with the story quest right uh, the gameplay smooth uh for most of the bethesda games where shooting is a aspect in the game i think they did really good it's still kind of got a little bit of a fallout feel to it but it's a bit more on point Right. than how the other games that they've released are. Right. But the whole concept that they have going on and the setup, really well-rounded game, really well put together. Most Bethesda games have these hiccups, these glitches, these exploits. Like, most of their games are going to have these issues. But this game still has that issue as well. I haven't seen a whole lot of it. Right. Just a couple little things here and there. I've seen people talk about being able to loot cases right. Right. that have money for the ships. So it's like you can buy a ship and then just loot your money back. Right. I haven't tried to do anything like that. But with those, with, with every Bethesda game, you're going to have some sort of glitch or exploit. But this one's really well put together. I, I personally, I usually go out of my way to find these little things, and I haven't really seen anything besides what some people have uploaded on YouTube. Right. And it's the same thing over and over so far, which, which is what I just mentioned, right. with you being able to purchase a ship and then steal your credits back. Other than that, I'm very impressed. Now, from what I understand in this game, it's got a little bit of Fallout. It's got a little bit of Skyrim. It's got a little bit of Outer World in it. And everyone who has been playing it so far, uh, game the six, so here it is the 15th. And so everybody has put in some hours into this game and have noticed that it has a little bit of pieces of everything from those three games. But what oddly it is to me that it also took one formula from another game and that's No Man's Sky. And I think, because if you look at No Man's Sky, it's the basic same concept as far as building a base, establishing a, a club, and then building a ship to explore our space to uh, mine rocks, visit other worlds. Um, are you getting that in this game with Starfield as far as a formula of No Man's Sky? 
for sure they definitely did come come to the uh, the establishment that with having multiple planets, having exploration, building an outpost, joining a faction, being able to have dogfights in space, they they definitely delivered. But in my opinion, the games are quite different. They still have a lot of similarities, but to be honest, it feels like Bethesda looked at No Man's Sky and said, hey, you guys did it wrong. We're going to try and get it right the first time. And they did a pretty good job, but the exploration is quite different. As far as I can tell with No Man's Sky, you can just be like, hey, I have so many light years I can jump. I'm going to jump from where I am now to a different solar system and start exploring fly straight down on a ship, see some beachfront property, start building an outpost, and do whatever you want. I feel like No Man's Sky really has that exploration feel to it, right. whereas Starfield has this, I'm driven in a direction. You know, that you're, you're told, hey, check out this solar system, check out this planet, go talk to this person. Right. And... I've only had like an hour, maybe two, to actually just explore for myself, and I said, you know what, I'm going to jump to this random solar system that's within range, jump to the first planet, and it's actually surprising because the solar system I went to only had one planet on it, which was a little different than all the other solar systems I had been to, but it was in like the Goldilocks zone, so I was like, you know what, the, the environment isn't extreme, it's got life on it. It's got a pretty fair day and night cycle. Let's start building my, my outpost. And I'll be completely honest, I was um, I was impressed at first with what all you can do with your outpost. But when I realized the materials and the amount of materials I needed, and I had already been like mining almost every single bit of minerals that I saw to begin with. And I was like, oh, there's something new here. I'm going to go ahead and grab this. Right. And I just, I didn't have what I needed to build an outpost. So I had to go back to the nearest solar system that I knew had a store on it so I could purchase the materials. And then when I came back, I only got to drop down like two parts of a whole building and I couldn't even use my building because I didn't put an airlock on the building. Right. So I was kind of stuck with a building that I couldn't use and a couple workbenches, which I was like, oh, I need these. I need to be able to work and craft because that's what almost every Bethesda game is about. And you're like, oh, man, I need to improve my weapons. I need to improve my armor. I need to improve my spacesuit in this game. Now, what most, what most people would like to know, the ones that are looking to buy Xbox Series X to play Starfield, is it simple to build a base? Is it complex? Is it easy to build a spaceship? Is it, you know, is that complex, hard to build, that you need certain materials to craft a spaceship or certain materials to build a, a, a base? And then once you build these things, are you granted to have automatic crew with you already or do you have to work on building your crew? So I'm gonna start that with, uh talking about the ship so building your ship you got a lot of freedom you can really just go all out and do whatever you want to be honest you can you can make a ship that's almost not flyable that just you were like I want to build a C like just make your ship look like the letter C or whatever design you want it's all gonna affect how it flies how it fights but as for actually getting the components for it, it's just money. You right. don't even have to like, oh, well, I'm missing this, that, and the other. No, you, you got credits, you can purchase what you need to purchase and then just slap your ship together. And it is pretty complex. You can, you can honestly mess up your ship just by moving a couple things around. And if you're not paying attention to how those things fit on your ship, you could just be like, oh, well, I'm done building my ship. And then you go to close it out and it'll tell you, no, you're not. You messed up something somewhere. You need to change this, that, and the other, which feels like it's taking away some of that freedom. But in reality, they're just trying to make your ship actually function. Because right. with some of these key components, you just like, for instance, your shield, there's a little drive that you have to have connected to your ship to have your shields. Right. And if you misplace it somehow, it'll tell you, 
that it's not connected, it's not working, and you're not going to have full function of your ship, and it won't let you leave that menu until you fix it, which well, again will cost you credits. It sound like it sound like more like a safety issue. Yes, yes, which is honestly fair because I'll tell you what, if I had just took off with what I had done with my ship. I would have been SOL on just about every aspect just because I was like, this is fun. Yeah. But when it comes to your outposts, yeah, you need as many ingredients and materials as you can find. And it's funny because, like with the Bethesda game, you walk through the world, you see some junk. If you're anything like me, I'm a klepto at that game, so I'm like, I need all the junk in the world because all of this is going to get used at some point. Right. When in reality, I'd say about 20% of the junk you find is actually going to get used, right. but every bit of materials that you can get your hands on will be used. Right. Like, you will need to pick up, say, iron and nickel and copper, and you'll turn that into some sort of wire. And right. you'll need that wire to build certain things on your base. Right. You won't need any of that with your ship, you just need credits. Right. But with, with your base, you're really going to have to go out of your way to get those ingredients. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to build anything. Well, see, like me, I can tell you this much. If I build a ship, it's going to be half incomplete, half baked. Because I'm going to go out into space, folks, and I'm going to turn into Buck Rogers. And I'm going to float... And I'm going to come back in the year 2024. Or what is it? 2020, 2042 or 2055 or something like that in the future. And become Buck Rogers when I got that little twinky little robot. Hey, Buck. Uh, that, that, that would be cool for me to do that in Starfield if I'm able to do that. But I have seen people who build Death Star Destroyers. And I urge people and I and I want to challenge people if you can build a Star Destroyer right I want to see somebody build a Battlestar Galactica ship oh, man. I want to see somebody actually build the, the United States Space Shuttle right now to be completely honest the range of the, the sheer scope that they allow you to build your ship right. is very impressive because like without giving too much detail the first they give you they call it a classic, right. which it gives you the feel like, hey, this is only going to be piloted by so many people, and it's got the basic functions, it's got storage capacity, and it's going to get the job done. But you can end up, if you've got the credits for it, you can build some massive ships. And it's like, oh, if they allow you to do it, you right. can fit like 12 of the original ships in it. Right. So it's just honestly mind-boggling that they were able to capture the fact that you can build whatever you can imagine as long as it fits within the scope or the diagram of what a ship is actually supposed to do and how its function works yeah and people please don't build ships that look like uh, a fork with a big fist on it like power to the black people because nobody wants to see that in space nobody wants to see uh, power to the black people in space no no no, no. we want to leave that out speaking of power to the black people Let's talk about the pronouns that's going on in these games. Now, from what I was told online, or saw online, that the pronouns are now in the games. Where you have a character who is telling you that she used to be a clone of a man, and she used to, the man that she was cloned from was from Francis, such and such and such and such in the game and now that is an uproar people are are mad about this now i want you to think i want you to think i want your idea on this prospect i want you to like tell me what you think of this because we deal with this in real life we deal with transgenders we deal with pronouns we do this in real life but when you put it in video games and then the video games is a is a a virtual world to escape from reality and now you bring in the reality into the game and this is what pisses people off because nobody wants to deal with reality 24 7 7 days a week this is what video games are video games are for a form of entertainment it's to get it's to escape from the harsh reality of the real world 
Now that Bethesda have put this in the game and it's made a controversial uproar about it. And I'm sure you build your character, you customize your character to be what it would. What do you feel about the pronouns in it? So in my honest opinion, um, the only time that I've seen the pronouns even actually brought up was during the char character creation. I haven't come across any any of the NPCs that specifically were like, hey, I identify as such and such, please refer to me as such and such, you know, and when it comes to the character customization, you can do pretty much whatever you want. It's still pretty basic for most character creation. You can mess with like, I guess you can mess with your genetics a little bit, but most people don't even sit down and spend that much time with it. I spent maybe a total of 30 minutes creating my character. You know, I na named him Sir Arthur Pendragon because, you know, we're in space. Let's bring it to a whole nother level because it just sounds fun. Like you said, escape from reality, bring some some fantasy stuff into the world and when i made my character they made specifically sure to be like hey do you want to identify as he him she her yeah. or whatever yeah. whatever you wanted and you know i went with the basics because you know my character is a male and he is sir arthur pendragon so i did do he him but for representation to be a thing because I can make a white character, I can make a black character, I can go with just about any race I want, and then I can choose to be like, well, he's male, but he has a feminine stance and a feminine walk. So, there's a lot of freedom there, but when it comes to specifically talking about pronouns, it's not really shoved down your throat, it's not something that's constantly in your face, but they give representation to those who want representation. Like, I, I don't need any more representation. I'm a white guy, I can make any white character in the world. If I wanted to, I could make a black character or an Asian character. But if I was in a group of minorities and I had no form of representation to begin with, I wouldn't necessarily be upset about it, but the fact that they went through to the effort they, get, they put in the effort to represent someone who feels like they're not very well represented to begin with right. is a nice touch. Right. You know, right. obviously right. some people aren't going to agree. Right. And to be honest, like you said, it's about escaping reality and enjoying right. yourself in this fantasy world. Right. But in that fantasy world, you have to expect that there's going to be more things to come than right. just him, her, she, them, however way you want to say it. Because right. to be honest, if if I wanted to, like, my character is a dude. Right. I gave him he, him pronouns. Right. But I gave him a feminine walk. Because to be honest, if I'm, if me personally, if I'm not walking fast, I have a slight sway in my hips, right, right. which some consider feminine. Right. So I went ahead and ran with that with my characters. I was, oh, that's an option. Why not? Because then I'm being represented in the game a lot better. Right, and, and, and I mean, like, and don't get me wrong. I don't have anything against pronouns. I don't have anything against transgender. I think it's wonderful that Bethesda is giving everyone an equal opportunity to be able to play whatever character they want to play in the game. But I think that because of the bad stuff that's happening in the real world when it comes to transgender, when it's uh, pushed on the kids, okay? Because you gotta look at the kids that's gonna be playing in this. And once again, we're pushing this, this gender thing on kids because they're getting it in the school, they're getting it at home, and now they're getting it in the game. And I just think that but that's the could have hold the ring back just a little bit. Because you can do the same feminine walk. Uh, in most games in the, in the past, you used to have body type 1, body type 2. Voice 1, voice 2, voice 3. Posture you know? 1, 2, and yeah. 3 as well. Yeah, yeah. So you, and then you had, yeah, the posture 1, 2, 3. So you had those different, so you didn't have to put... Uh, 
pronouns and be political with pronouns in it. So I just think they could have went in that avenue. I understand it's equal opportunity for everyone. Uh, they want to not alienate uh, the LBG community, which I, you know, I don't, you know, I wouldn't alienate them because I have friends that are gay. Okay, and they are part of the LBG. But, uh, but in when it comes to playing games, the game is a is a fix. And, and let let me let you guys understand this. Those who hate video games, okay, video games is not a games that for people who don't think, who like to sit on their behind all day, brains are mush. Okay, and they have no life and they still act like five year olds. You people go out and what do you do to escape from reality? You drink, you party, you smoke, you get your hair done, you get your nails done. That's escaping from your reality. Video game to us is that escape from reality. It's putting us into another fictional world to where when we have a hard day at work, and we are stressed we trying to find ways to pay our bills we trying to cope with everyday life as business at work but we dealing with nasty customers and people with nasty attitudes and we come home and we're stressed we play video games video game is our escape from the real world and so when we play video games it's not just because we just stupid and got nothing else to do and we low lives this is our drug this is our addiction this is what we do to escape from reality to get away from all the negativity and then when we're done our brain is reset back to normal and then we go okay now i'm ready for the next day i'd rather do that than to get an ak-47 and go out and kill somebody because I'm having a real pissed day. What was that? What was that movie uh, with? Uh, Dang, what was that movie with? Uh, was it Michael Douglas? I think it was Michael Douglas uh, when he had a bad day. I I forget what that movie is. If you guys know what that movie is, put it down in the in the comment in the comments below. But it was when he was about. having a bad day yeah, he and traffic. he's stuck in traffic, yeah, no, and then exactly and then he about. freaking flipped off and started just going off on people. You know, now if he was to take that energy, that frustration, that anger, put it in video games, he's a gamer. And that is what video games are, is to for us to get away from us not to explode, not to go out and harm somebody because we are pissed off every day. That we hate the world because the world is going to shit. So if we can escape that, then escape their playing in video games. Yeah. Absolutely. Now see, I, 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 the way I see it with video games is I like having mental stimulation. Right. You know, I, and don't get me wrong, I enjoy physical stimulation too, just to a certain extent. You know, some people, they're going to go, hey, I can't wait to get off work or I can't wait to leave school and go home and start up my dirt bike and hit the trails, hit the road, you know. And just blow off some steam or you know on the other end of that being like yo I've got a gun I'm not saying I'm gonna go out and shoot people but I am gonna go out and go shooting because I like the feel I like the smell it gives me a bit of adrenaline it's something that I enjoy doing just like someone's gonna go hey I'm gonna pick up a basketball and I'm gonna play a game even though you're not playing seriously you're doing it to enjoy yourself you're escaping from the day-to-day monotonous dreary lifestyle that you you know and you could have an exciting job too but depending on who you are you're going to have different out- outlets that's just plain and simple how it is our outlet is video games right you know and i play video games to escape reality but i also play them because i want that mental stimulation like right. i'll sit down and i'll play grand theft auto online not because i fantasize about shooting people but because there's all these cool things that they put in the game and I can set a goal for myself to be like, hey, I want to make sure I make at least $2 million within this time frame so I can spend that money on a bunch of random stuff in game that I think is cool and that I will enjoy. 
Right, because I look at GTA 5 and I see that it's something you can possibly do in the real world, but it's not required because let me tell you folks, there's a ripple effect. When you do something that you do in video games in real life, this is cause and effect. Things that you do will have consequences. You can die, you can go to jail, you can die going to jail. Okay? But is it worth you losing your freedom? No. So if you're angry and you're frustrated and you're pissed off, play video games. Hell, I play Division 2 almost every day. I get to kill bad guys every day. Now, do I picture the people that I hate in the game? Yeah. But it relieves my stress. It relieves my 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 conscience to say, hey, I can't do these people, I can't do this to people in real life. So I'ma do it in the video game. And I think that when you play games like Starfield, it puts you into a, another world where we would never ever venture in space. Okay? Right. We're not astronauts, we're not military people, we're just average Joe. So we are taking Starfield and making it to, in our perspective, our fantasy, to say, hey, if I'm able to go into space, what would I do in space? Absolutely. I can go venture this planet, or I can go venture that planet and make friends and meet aliens, and, and hopefully good aliens, bad aliens, I will get into danger, I will get lost, knowing me, I will definitely get lost because I can't drive worth for shit but that's me but that is what video game do for you people is to take you out of reality into fantasy and this is why people like politicians and all these high executive wants to ban and destroy video games because they think there's nonsense it's, it's, it's poppycock that they think Oh, my kid, all he does is play video games all day. He's just sitting in his room, rotting away. He's just wasting away because he's so stupid. No, 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 no. No, he's not. He's escaping from your bullshit. Your nagging, your constant nagging. Your constant bickering. What he goes through every day in school, bullying. You know? Do you ever bother to sit down with your child and say, Hey, how was your day? Oh, yeah? It was, it was that rough? Well, explain to me. Tell me about it. Then maybe he won't need the video game. But since nobody, no adults is listening to him, he goes into video games. And adults these days think video game is just a waste. You're just wasting your time. Starfield is a game that I believe can help stimulate the people's mind. Can make help them escape reality. It's like a therapy session. You need that therapy to offset your mind, to reset. Because if you don't reset your mind, you will lose it. Oh, absolutely. And I have done seen people come unglued very quickly and have lost their life and take other lives that have nothing to do with what happened to that individual. Like a person jumps off a bridge in the middle of traffic but he's not only killing himself, he's killing everyone else on the freeway. Because why? Because when you dive in front of a freeway, you cause accidents. Accidents cause deaths. And even if somebody doesn't die besides the person who jumped from the bridge, you're putting all those other people into a traumatic experience, which exactly. is going to remind them that this is reality, actions have consequences, and now they're going to think, when I go do this one activity, is now it's going to be like, well, this is my opportunity to off myself. Right. Which honestly, you know, you can do whatever you want in life, but when you start affecting others, there's a bit of an issue there. You know, you can always try and improve yourself and try and improve other people's, you know, views or their quality of life, but when you make those decisions, you also have to remember you aren't just affecting yourself you are affecting others affecting everyone around even, you even yes. if you go out and do something where you assume you're alone but at some point someone's going to come across it and be like whoa what is this what happened here and they might have a different reaction to it but you're still affecting them right 
but whereas when you turn on a video game and you do things with other people, yeah, they get affected, but it's not going to traumatize them for life. Like, sure, sure, some video games are very traumatic. Some video games have warnings at the very beginning of it, like, hey, just letting you know, any actions you decide to take in real life that, you know, can be depicted in this game, we're not going to be held liable for because they're not they're not pushing you to do this they're giving right. you the option and the outlet to do it in a technically in a safe environment right. so that way you are not completely affecting other people like they've got that new texas chainsaw massacre game which is you know just like another dead by daylight or one of those other horror games where you're going to go out and you can choose to be the hunter you can choose to be the prey or the victim right and they give you all these brutal scenes and you can murder somebody you can do whatever you want but they're giving you the outlet in a video game they're not trying to hold your hand and be like hey just saying remember you can do this in reality and right. as true as that is right. once again if you make that decision to right. go out in reality and do it that's your decision that's on you they didn't coax you to do it they're trying to give you a way to do it without affecting other people. Well, it's just like this game called Hatred. Yeah. And I played it just two weeks ago, and I stopped. Because it's so close to reality, to where you just... Okay, if some of you guys don't know what Hatred is, it's a character who hates the world. And he ranks up all these weapons, AK semi-automatics, handguns, bombs, and then he goes out and he randomly kills people for no apparent reason. He's open fires on them in the street, busting their homes and kill them in their sleep, or kill them if they in the living room watching TV for no apparent reason. I seen it when he grabbed this woman and slit her throat for no apparent reason. Goes into a mall and open fire in a mall. Now that kind of game I will not condone. I do not support it. But I wanted to see how bad this game was because it was a very old game. Mm -hmm. And I remember it had a big controversy about it. So I said, let me see how bad it was. So I went on Steam and I bought it for five bucks. And I played it. For 20 seconds. I was like, oh my gosh. This is breeding violence. This is breeding Putting, some, putting ideas into a child's head or a person's mind who's already unstable they're to still, say... They're still developing. Yeah, to say, hey, this is a simulator. We're going to try this out where you're going to grab all the weapons and go out and kill everyone that you don't like. And anyone who stands in your way, you have the right to kill them. You're, you're, you're telling... You, this game is telling them that it's okay to do that, even though it's a game. But it's, it's, it's a training session, a session for murder. Yeah. And so I played it for 20 seconds, people. 20 seconds. And I came out of the house and opened fire. These people were sitting at the bus stop. I just shot them. Then walked down the block, broke into someone's home. Three people were sitting watching TV. I shot them on the couch. Then walk up. Down, back out in the street. Down, car was coming to me. Open fire on the car with the with the person driving. He hits a tree, shot him dead. Woman ran to me, grabbed her behind throat, slit her throat. Slit a, a police officer throat. A police officer who tried to stop me. And the cops is coming in, and I'm open fire on the police officer. I caught this one cop and stabbed him in his forehead. It gives you that ability to be that violent. Quite, now, quite literally a murder simulator game. Yeah. It's not... It's, it, it, now, I, yeah, I, I may be condescending because I played, you know, Division 2, but Division 2 is dealing with terrorists where a faction is taking over DC and you have to stop these factions from corrupting DC. That's something totally different than to go out and kill innocent people. Here in, in, in Division, you stop in a faction who are known terrorists, who are out there trying to do bodily harm, and you're doing the right thing to stop them. 
in hatred, you're just plain out hating, and you're just going out just killing people for no apparent reason. It, it's it's funny that you bring up division because in my mind, the first thing I went to was Grand Theft Auto because Grand Theft Auto is one of those games that's always allowed you to just be like, well, you have a gun, there's pedestrians, you can mow them down. Or, oh, you have a knife, you may be able to slit their throat or stab them in the side or in the kidney, you know, whatever's lethal. Oh, and most in, in Grand Theft Auto Online, they give you a wide variety of melee weapons which all come with their own actions. Oh, well, yeah. Now, yeah. But here's the funny thing. Even with Grand Theft Auto Online, when you're doing certain missions and there are civilians, innocent civilians, they actually will restrain you from being able to actually shoot them. Like, there are ways around it, but, for instance, there's a specific mission in GTA Online where you do a certain heist and you do a certain setup and you have to go into a casino. And when you get into the penthouse, you, can, you only have targets that you are supposed to take out. And when you aim your gun at them, it turns, your reticle turns red, you fire, and they die. Right. But if you look at any of the bystanders in the crowd, it won't let you shoot. Right. It literally says, like, hey, just letting you know, it's kind of wrong to do that. Right. You know, they're, they're not pushing it in your face that, hey, remember, these are innocent people, and you can do whatever you want to them. But it's also giving you the whole, maybe you should remember you're on a mission, you have goals, you have targets, you shouldn't be just killing everyone because we gave you the option to kill everyone. Right. But, well, it's just like another one. It's very, uh, we, we can talk about. I know we're going off the course with Starfield oh, here, but let's talk about another game that we think that was violent. Let's talk about the Call of Duty. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the, now I'm talking about the one scene. I think it's Modern Warfare uh, Two, where they went into the airport and no start shooting up everyone. Russia. Yeah. Or no more Russian. It's yeah. Like one of those things. Yeah. When they go into the airport and they start shooting everybody up in the airport. And that was wrong because we, in reality, we had an incident that happened when someone got shot up in the air. When airport. that game released and people hit that mission, people were having literal physio physiological reactions to it. They, people knew what they were doing was wrong. Well, yeah. There were some people who were like, oh my god, I can't believe they let me do this. And yeah, they enjoyed it. But I'll tell you what. Most people, when they did that, they were like, I can't believe what they're having me do. This is... This is wrong. This is what mission is this? Why am I doing this? Well, yeah, it's like what serves its purpose? Because when I played it, it made me sick to my stomach that Absolutely. I'm just shooting innocent people. Yeah, and and we and, and folks, we're not just talking about just innocent people. We're talking about men, women, and children. If they they went into the detail to where if you actually walk around in that airport and yeah. you go to like where there's bathrooms, if you listen. You can hear people crying in the yeah. bathrooms. Like they're like, "This is my only safe haven. If they find me, I'm gonna die." Yeah. Which is reality. Right. That mission was so vivid. That was brutal. Yes, it. It was brutal. I it mean, you just, walk up to people and just shot them in the head while they're laying on the floor. Mm -hmm. That was brutal. But see, that's what we're talking about. But then, like I said, but when you get a game like Starfield, that gives you uh, a peace of mind. To venture out in space, to explore, to visit. You know, like Star Trek, to explore a strange new world, seek out new civilization, to boldly go where no man's gone before. We have never been into space other than astronauts. We normal human beings who are everyday 24 7 working class people would never venture into space. I'll tell you right now, if, if an extraterrestrial, if, the, if they're, I, I don't want to say if they're out there because in my opinion I believe somewhere out there there's got to be something else but if if like Guardians of the Galaxy if a ship was to land down in front of me and they gave me the option right. to leave Earth right. I, would, I, would, I would I would jump on it yeah no I, I, I would, would, I, would I, I would go but I would at the same time I know I'm more than likely leaving everything that I've ever known behind because uh -huh. Once you step on that ship and you leave the planet, there's no guarantee. It's like when you get on a boat and you go out to the middle of the ocean. Unless you know exactly what you're doing, you know where you are, and you know how to navigate, and you know of survival skills, you're probably not going to make it back. Most boats nowadays are safe, but when you think about it, 
if you don't know what you're doing and you're the person piloting that boat and you just go out, you're not paying attention to your fuel gauge, you're not paying attention, you don't look at the stars and know where you are, yeah. you're gonna end up becoming stranded and you might just die out there. You might just die out there. And yeah. when it comes to Starfield and these video games where you have the ability to actually venture out into space and explore, you don't have that fear. I mean, sometimes you might have that fear like, what if I don't know how to get back? Well, I don't, I didn't pay attention to the star system I was in, so now I have no idea besides whether or not they give you a mission or a cursor to be like a waypoint like hey don't forget this is where you need to go because beyond that it is so hard to get lost in space even in no man's sky yeah unless you drop down one of those outposts and you're like well i have the outpost saved so i know i can just go right back to that outpost yeah. it's just vastness out there well it's, it's totally different because in real life when you go out in space there's it's all different variants yeah. You get lost out there, you get into a black hole, you get too close to a dying star and get destroyed. Mm -hmm. You go into a world where it is hostility, well not hostility, but host hostile environment mm -hmm. where you are uh, meeting uh, strange aliens that may be aggressive and you will die. But you know, we, we see a lot of things in movies and some of the fantasies that they have in the movies where Hollywood always makes seems like the good guy would always win but in real life you're not gonna win if you don't know what you're doing in space that's why we are not astronauts astronauts don't even know themselves because they they get directions from NASA NASA say go point A and point B which means go there come back you know they didn't say hey Go venture out and if you find something, uh, let us know. Because if we let them go further than, say, Saturn, they're not coming back. They're not coming back. They're going to get lost. Not unless we've already reached a point where we can clone ourselves or continue, like upload our memory onto a hard drive and download it to a new body or yeah, hey, whatever it is. We, we clone chickens. Yeah, why not no. clones human beings? We, you know, we cloning their uh, animals. Only so far away from that, yes. But once again, in reality, you set a course for something. You tell somebody to explore. They're probably not going to make it back. No, no. It is not even a probability. It's a certain fact that they did not. They're not going to come back because we are not meant to venture out in space. We're not anything equipped. further than our own solar system. Yeah, we go anything further than that, we're lost. Pretty much. Because it's unless you have a GPS built in a spaceship, like say, okay, turn right back around, you you know, it'll take you right back to it's Earth. South. And Which way is south? Yeah, there is no south. Yeah. No west. There's exactly. no east. There's no north in space. There's yeah. none. Your your directions are the stars around you, just like when you're on a ship out at sea back in. 1800s or however far back you want to go that the technology wasn't there you look up you map the stars you see where you are and when you're in space and you're traveling you're not gonna you're not gonna see that much of a difference especially with the technology we have nowadays right. so it's just not really feasible yeah. that's why we play these games so we can do something that's not feasible as much as we'd like it to be right. we're so far away from being able to do something like that and that's why we need that escape from reality yeah. because without that escape we can't just explore we can't just go out and do something that we normally wouldn't be able to do like Someone who can only afford so much money obviously isn't going to be able to, oh, well, I wanted to buy this new toy. Well, our new toy is a console and some video games, which, yes, is expensive. Oh, yeah. But compared to the people who are like, well, I bought a brand new car, and the whole goal of me buying this car, you know, like some one of the newer Jeeps or whatever, I want to go off-roading, I want to go rock climbing with my car, I want to go rock crawling, whatever they call it. You know, everyone has their own outlet. Our outlet is playing video games. Yes, and, and then that is our drug. So, I know we diverted from Starfield with all these crazy stuff that we've been coming up to, but my uh, final question to you, 
do you think Starfield is a game of the year contender against Spider-Man? Now, I'm sure you've seen Spider-Man. Absolutely. You've seen how Spider-Man 2 game looks. And mind you, they dropped a new trailer. Um, State of Play has uh, came out uh, 2 o'clock today. Uh, we will be talking about that one. We'll be doing another video after this. Uh, talking about the state of play, but they gave a little bit more glimpse glimpse of Spider-Man 2 to show you how big the world map is When it comes to Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Now folks, once again, if you've never been to New York, New York City is a big city Okay um, It may not be as big as California, but the islands itself is big and you do have Manhattan, you have Bronx, you have Brooklyn, you have Queens, you have Staten Island Okay, you have Long Island. Okay. And it's massive. For them to put in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens, you can tell that this game is going to be huge. And the gameplay. Oh my god, they just already walked me with the gameplay. With Peter being Venom and then Venom a standalone character. Now, Christian, I know you're an Xbox player. And I know you like Starfield. Do you think Starfield has a chance in hell against Spider-Man 2 for Game of the Year? Specifically saying against Spider-Man 2, I'll be honest, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Spider-Man 2 just took the win. Because, like, Starfield with the 36, 38 hours, however many, it's, it's, I haven't hit 40 yet. It's a great game. It runs smooth. It looks amazing. The mechanics are a lot better than a, some previous Bethesda titles. And it definitely would give most games a run for their money. But bringing it to the idea of space and space exploration, some of the mechanics when it comes to landing and flying your ship, and the way the planets are set up, nothing about it is dense like it it's very open that there's expanse like how there is in space there's plenty of expanse most of the planets you go to like if they have life on it there's some creatures here and there some flora some fauna but cities the cities are just like you would find in skyrim they're small like even the largest city like once you actually have explored it you feel like there's not much left to it. And with the way the Spider-Man game seems, it would feel bigger than you exploring space, at least compared to Starfield. Because, with, like I said, with that Starfield, it's expansive. You can jump from one solar system to another solar system. You can check out the planets and the moons. And yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot of ground to cover. But to be able to walk around in a city completely different and i'm not saying oh just because space in general no i mean if you were to walk around in a city in real life and take your time going from point a to point b and you were like hey i gotta go hit the subway so i can get somewhere else or i'm gonna get in my car and drive somewhere else there's a lot of stuff between where you are and somewhere else but with Starfield, there's a lot of nothing. And I'm not, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I'm also not trying to paint it in a pretty light either. Because when you leave a city on a planet, you're not going to be able to walk from that city to the next city. And if you could even, there's going to be a whole lot of nothing in between here and there. In Skyrim, just using that example, or even Fallout, when you sit down and you play the game and you go, hey, I'm going to walk from point to point, there are going to be these points where there's not a whole lot between them, but there's usually encounters. There's usually something to help fill that space. And in, in Starfield, I feel like it's just too expansive with not a lot in between. And comparing that to a game where you're going to have a city, there's going to be people, there's going to be vehicles, there's going to be enemies, there's going to be random interactions. It's a whole other ballpark. 
because you're just there's going to be stuff in your face all the time. So, oh, what's that? Oh, how's this look? Starfield, you only get that when you enter a city or you enter a building. And like I said, the cities are large. Some of the buildings feel like cities, right. but in reality, when you, once you explore the building, you realize, well, it's large, but it's not town square. It's not, well, this is an apartment building, so you have a hundred floors and 50 rooms per floor. It's, you've got this room, you've got these stairs, you've got this, you've got that. And try to compare that to a game that actually has actual buildings, actual depth, people that you're gonna run into constantly. I'll be honest, I feel like Starfield pales in comparison. Like uh, it's a great game, it's a, it's, it's, it's and a, it's a, it, it'll give other games a run for their money for game of the year. Yeah. But comparing it to a game like Spider Man, Spider Man Two specifically. Spider Man Two, I, like I said, it's 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 a gorgeous game. I like how they did the lizard in this one. I am definitely stoked how they did Venom. I'm a Venom fan, and I've been watching and been reading comic books since I was a kid. Okay, I remember when I had my first, my very first number one Spider-Man issue, and then later on down the line we got introduced to Venom, and later on down the line we got introduced to Carnage, and I fell in love with Spider-Man because Spider-Man, no matter how many odds was against him, always found a way to come up on top. And still pulling his punches. And still pulling it, yeah. And, and, and will make crazy, wise-ass crack jokes in the middle of a battle. But let me tell you, in the Carnage series, in Carnage, Peter Parker had his behind handed to him. He got his butt whipped because he's stopping two of the most craziest symbiotes that he had ever faced. And if, if people don't, don't have ever read comic books, let, let me tell you uh, how the symbiote started. Okay, and I, I'm going to say it real quick because we've been already 50 minutes into this video. Um, so, there was a battle in space. All the superheroes was battling in space. And I think it was when Galactus was coming or something. And Spider-Man was on the planet and found this glob. And he brought it back to Earth. The first people that Peter Parker, Spider-Man, gave this glob to to figure out what it was was the Fantastic Four. Reed Richards studied that symbiote. Okay, the symbiote escaped and found Peter Parker, and then melded with Peter Parker, which turned him into Venom, the Dark Spider. -Man. Okay. Then after Peter Parker knew that because of his attitude was changing, he was hurting the ones that he loved and he was ignoring his oath as a superhero, he had to get rid of the symbiote. The symbiote, he found a weakness, which was high pitched sound. And he did something to make the suit come off him. The suit went after Eddie Brock. Which Eddie Brock was the next victim that became them as we know now. Eddie Brock hated Spider Man because Spider Man thwarted him in every chance he get. He hated Peter Parker too because Peter Parker would outshine him. And when they was both working at the Daily Bugle, they both was taking pictures, and Peter Parker amazingly would have better pictures than Eddie Brock because. Peter Spider-Man. He's taking pictures because he could. Yeah, he taking selfies of himself. So of course he's gonna outshine Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock hated Peter. And hated him. When the symbiote knew that they had a relations, he melded with Eddie Brock. But Eddie Brock didn't know that Peter Parker and Spider-Man were the same person. And the only reason why he knew that was because Venom told him. And then Venom went after Aunt May. Then he went after Mary Jane. And then he went after Gwen Stacy. Was Gwen Stacy was very close to Peter, 
and she was a detective not the Gwen Stacy that we know in the Spideyverse where she is also Spider Woman mm-hmm. or Spider Girl but in our universe she was a detective and she got killed by Carnage in the, and she got killed because of the battle between Venom and Carnage she was in the middle and she got killed and it devastated Peter because Peter that was his best friend and I think Peter Parker had feelings for Gwen Stacy because at that time him and Mary J was rocky they had split up a little bit it was rocky and I think he had and he felt guilty the simple fact that she died and he couldn't do nothing to protect her so as broken as beating and as battered as Peter Parker was he still carried on to try to stop the two from tearing up New York City with fighting each other the venom and carnage because you know they destroyed everything that they was you know they came across they killed everyone that they came across in the midst of battling each other and Peter Parker had to try to find a way to stop them now mind you in this comic book series you didn't have Miles Morales Miles Morales is not thought of until this year but if you look back at the old comic books Peter Parker did all this on his own to stop it he didn't get help from the Fantastic Four he didn't get any help from the Avengers he didn't get any help from the Defenders he didn't get help from the West Coast Avengers he didn't get help from the Hulk he didn't get help from Thor he didn't get help from the X-Men he had to fight Venom and Carnage on his own and the only way Peter Parker was able to win this battle is that he had to side with Venom. He had to become Venom's sidekick or friend to thwart Carnage. To stop him in his tracks from killing people. That's the only way he was able to survive. Because if he still had to fight the both of them at the same time, Peter Parker would not be alive. Peter Parker as Spider-Man would have been dead a long time ago. So by using his intellect, he knew that he had to pick someone. My friend, my you know how the old saying is? The enemy of my enemy is my friend? Absolutely. There you go. And that's why he picked Venom. Even though Venom was stronger and was built more tougher, but he rather picked someone that was more, he knew that Venom was more level-headed. Even though he had... Carnage was pure destruction. Carnage was pure evil. Yeah. Okay, he was pure evil. Venom was evil, but not pure evil. He was driven. He was an anti-hero. Yeah. But he wasn't pure evil. And so that's why he sided with Venom. So if if everybody was interested in looking at the comic books, go to Marvel. Uh, leave the link down below. Uh, for the website to go to marvel.com and you can see all the old comic books um, and you can probably read the story the original story of how spider-man and uh, uh, became the venom in the black suit and then how venom became venom with eddie brock and then you want to know us another surprise there was a one cameo appearance who had uh before eddie brock had the suit and i don't think many people will remember this but eddie brock before Eddie Brock got the suit, there was one person who had the suit for just a glimpse of a time, but then Venom couldn't melt with him really good. Flash Thompson. Flash Thompson had the suit one time. It's because he was disappointed. See, Venom feeds on people with negativity and disappoint and hatred. Flash Thompson was disappointed. He had a little bit of hate. He had a little bit of what you call the dark side. But not enough to quench Venom's thirst for hatred, evil power. So he did meld with Flash Thompson one time. And uh, it didn't work out. And then later on, he went to Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock became the final product. He was the final Venom. And um, so, not many people will remember that. And, and I, I, I suggest that a lot of people, you know, go to Marvel, look up the comic books, look at, look at some of the old Spider-Man uh, collectibles, especially from the 1980s on up. 
um, and you'll see some of the interesting story and that's why when I look at Isomniac on how they doing it I know they doing this a whole totally new different twist when it comes to Venom but I always tell people if you want to look at the real story who discovered Venom who was uh, learning about Venom look at it because it originally started with Spider-Man finding him in space brought him back to Earth Fantastic Four Reed Richards was studying to figure out what this glob was was when he noticed that and who named him symbiote or symbiote was Reed Richards Reed Richards discovered that it was a symbiote but in, in further studies he wanted to know what this thing was able to do and it knew that the symbiote couldn't survive without being with a host and so and you know Carnage is from Venom it's a, it's a skin that was from Venom that was in the midst of a battle he was battling somebody and some of the skin from the Venom costume had a mind of its own and wandered off so Hollywood changed everything around and like I said it's interesting to read the comic books but uh yeah we've been like an hour now on this thing and we like keep going off the topic of, of Starfield um I I own a PS5 and an Xbox Series X. I have not played Starfield yet. I'm hoping to play this weekend, coming up to play with it. But Christian, I thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts and your um, experience on Starfield. And people, I suggest you buy it. It's wonderful. It may not be game of the year. It's not all perfect, but it's a game that will take you from the harsh world of reality. If you're a space exploration, you wish you was able to go on space, or you wish you was on Star Trek, or you wish you was on Battlestar Galactic, or you wish you was Buck Rogers, or you wish that you would just be on a UFO spaceship and just travel space, give Starfield a try. Give hell, hell, give No Man's Sky a try. No Man's Sky came a long way, it's a great game too. You know, play games. I think uh, you'd be surprised of how much fun you will have, especially in these uh, dark times that we're living now. So, um, I want to thank everybody for watching the show. Christian, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. Of course. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we do have another video that we are thinking about doing, um, which is the state of play if we have enough time. Um, so uh look out for that video coming up next after this um so once again guys thank you for watching the show thank you for taking the time please share it with this with everyone i think everyone should be uh have knowledge of starfield and what xbox doing and i'm and i'm glad that Bethesda is getting xbox out of the dark light and into the light because playstation needs a competitor you know, like I said in my last videos back, good cannot survive without evil. Evil cannot survive without good. So with that final note, y'all, have a good night. Thank you for watching. God bless.